Today, our guest is Kim de Blaycourt. 0.001 of the world's orphans will ever be adopted. Welcome to Heritage of Truth. Today our guest is Kim de Blaycourt. Hi, it's Hi. very nice to have you with us. Oh, it's so nice to be with you. Now Kim is an author. She wrote a book called Until We All Come Home, A Harrowing Journey, A Mother's Courage, A Race to Freedom. Why don't you tell us what prompted you to write this book? Well, I have to give all glory immediately to our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. um, once. A our family experienced this journey with him, this adoption journey with him. It really just made so much clear to us. So this book is about an adoption. It is about our family's adoption of our youngest mm -hmm. from Ukraine, the country of Ukraine. Okay. And it taught us much more than what you would expect as far as adding a member to your family. It, what it really drove home to us was the relationship that as a Christian, I have with our Heavenly Father because He adopted me. So our journey, I want to tell your viewers right now, is not a typical adoption journey. This is not typical whatsoever. We are so pro-adoption and so very much pro-orphan care. Mm -hmm. So we would never want our journey to offend or halt anyone from pursuing those uh, very noble callings. But we were caught up in a cycle of corruption. We had already adopted our son. Mm -hmm. I had already processed him out of the orphanage, and then that's when it started. And approximately one year later, I was able to bring the little boy, then known as Sasha, now known as Jacob, home. Mm -hmm. I lived in the country of Ukraine, wearing Ukrainian clothing, speaking Russian for almost a year after my husband and daughter had already returned home to Holland, Michigan. You learned Russian during that time? Yes. Um, but you know, it's one of the ways, isn't that amazing how God prepares us ahead of time before he calls us to things? Mm -hmm. I have always had an ear for languages that can only be due to God. I had always had a place in my heart for wounded children that could mm -hmm. only come from God. Mm -hmm. um, I was always interested in cultural differences and I was always interested in law. And all of those things came together in that one year. Oh, isn't that amazing? That, that reminds me of that tapestry idea of God weaving a tapestry of our lives and the dark parts that, you know, we can't see that the dark parts are actually adding some sort of depth or, or you know, beauty to, to the rest of it. I and mean, if you look at, at a painting without any shadows, it's not pretty. Exactly. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Joseph's story. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of all the time he spent in jail and persecuted and as a slave. He had no idea what all that was leading to. But I have to tell you, I think Joseph handled it much better than I did. <laughs> so, so tell us a little more about that story. Well, it was in uh, the Russian-speaking sector of Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. in the Odessa Oblast. Mm -hmm. It was during their last presidential election, so it was a heated political time. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine had already begun their push for entrance into um, the EU, the European Union. And our young prosecutor was part of that political party. And so not everybody was for international adoption. A lot of people started wanting their children to stay within their own country. Regardless of the fact that our son was orphaned the day after he was born, mm -hmm. regardless of the fact that for four years almost they tried to find him a home within Ukraine and couldn't. There are some people who don't understand that these children are best served in families first. And aren't we glad that God modeled that for us? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think especially of the Paul letters to the Galatians and Ephesians, where he really talks about this adoption and how we can cry out to Abba Father mm -hmm. and how he brings us into that relationship as brothers and sisters to Jesus Christ. And we call each other brother and sister because of that. And we can call him Father. Mm -hmm. And when I think of adoption now, 
I think of that. Yes. <laughs> and I think of the privilege of being able now, since our story, of being able to work with orphans around the world. It's just such a calling on my life. And God has just continued to open door after door after door. And it all started here with mm -hmm. Until We All Come Home, of fighting to get this young boy home that nobody in Ukraine wanted to adopt. Nobody could step up and adopt. Mm. And yet we were called, we were called specifically to Ukraine to adopt from. And then when all this happened and they told us we would never get him home. Wow. How God miraculously. You will read miracle after miracle in this book. And when you get done, I, I hope that you will join me in saying only, only by God. the grace of God. Yes. yes. Yeah. Now, I have to know, is this your little boy and you? or It is. That is in the Domolutki, or the baby home. That is in so sweet. Ismail, Ukraine. And you have to wait for them to touch really? you first. Oh, really? And, and I was so anxious because you just want to hug them and you just want to hold them, but they've never been mm. loved that way. And so I was waiting for him to come to me, and that was the one thing he always liked to do. And one day our interpreter, because he spoke Russian, and I was still learning Russian, so I was mm -hmm. speaking English, would come with me mm -hmm. to the Domoludki to visit him, and she took that picture. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's one of my treasured pictures. How old is he now? Jacob is seven. He just completed the first grade in a lovely uh, private Christian school there in Holland, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And this little boy that they told me, oh, he'll never be able to attend regular school. Um, he will always need special help, you know, et cetera, is at the top of his class, a straight A student, and Yay. he accepted the Lord. Oh, fantastic. Can I just tell you, as a mother leading your son, oh, so precious. Adoption, international adoption seems to be coming um, a lot more prevalent in the last several years. Um, I know Russia has closed, haven't they? Yes. Yeah, yes. Russia has closed. And But are there, are there still a lot of countries that, that have children available yes. for adoption? Yes, there are, you know, including the United States. I know, there's so many in the there U.S. There are. And when you're a, an orphan care advocate or an adoption advocate, you advocate for the children here in your own country that need homes as well. Absolutely. So I would really want to make sure your viewers know that it uh, extends to our own children oh, here. Oh, there are so many children in foster care and in group homes and things that they desperately need. Desperately. Families. Desperately. I was yeah. speaking with Jim Liskey from Prison Fellowship recently, and he was telling me, and he just emphatically looked me in the eye and he said, Kim, if we could empty the foster homes in America, you could empty our prison system by 70%. I believe that. Absolutely. We need to Especially claim that. Especially if there's a father in the home. Yes. It's so important for fathers to be there for their children. In international adoption, right now what we're seeing is incredible spiritual warfare. I mean, to levels that we have never seen before. Mm -hmm. Countries are being manipulated and closed to international adoption. Uh, we already were maybe at the most 1% were being adopted, and now it's, it's a tiny percentage of that. Wow. Less than 0.001 mm -hmm. of the world's orphans will ever be adopted. Point zero zero one. Yes, less than. Now I want you to think about that when you think about the numbers of 140 or 150 or 160 million. And those are just estimates. Mm -hmm. We really don't know because in many countries these children aren't counted because well, they're they, living on the street. Yes. Yeah. On their own. And so same Garbage thing has dumps. claimed them. Yes. Yeah on the streets, mm -hmm. in the sewer systems, mm -hmm. to keep warm. Um, Satan is fighting tooth and nail for them. They are the largest feeder group for human trafficking, mm -hmm. and many of them, nobody even knows that they're missing. Yeah. So there's no way to get on top of the true numbers. But Satan has claimed them. He wants them. He's taking advantage of them. And I, I believe that God knew, of course, he knew everything mm -hmm. before it ever began to happen. But this is one of the reasons why I believe as Christians we are mandated to care for the orphan. 
Right, exactly. And it is time for the church to rise up and at least be praying. Yes. At least we can pray. I mean, even if you can't adopt, you can be praying for these orphans. Yes. And and I know what, I really think that's the best thing we can do. Mm -hmm. Because if we continue to pray for our leaders Mm -hmm. and we continue to pray for... Uh, like Jed Medefend of the Christian Alliance for Orphans, or Jason Kovacs and Dan Kruver of Together for Adoption, mm-hmm. and these different bold Christian um, agencies and organizations that are coming together to lead the church in these types of areas and pray for the children and pray for their direct caregivers and pray for these ministries that are stepping alongside these pastors in these countries where they're asking their congregation, I'm sorry, um, but you know, the, this, the parents of these five children have now died of AIDS and we need somebody from the church to step up and take them home. Yeah. And that's what these pastors are doing in these communities. We, and the, to pray for them and pray for the missionaries that are coming along aside. That is the best thing we can do. Absolutely. Well, I thank you so much, Kim, for being our guest today. Where can people find you online? Online, they can find me at either kimdeblaycourt.com or at my blog ministry, which is Nourished Hearts, that's E-D, and then with an S at the end, hearts.com. This is her book, again, until we all come home. Thank Thank you you so so much. much.